All right, guys, welcome back. So in this video here, you're gonna find out that we kind of ran into a couple of fit up issues and we had to go ahead and, and adapt to those on the fly. Um, anyway, this collector box turns out awesome. And I uh, just wanted to thank you for tuning in. By the way, if you need help with your build, check out the description for all the links. And please, so you don't miss another video, hit that old button there, subscribe and uh, get notifications. So anyway, here we go. So we're back, we got our second coat done and now we're doing our second fitting and we're running into some issues, which is totally normal. So what we have is a gap and we don't have a consistent gap, we have an uneven gap. So is our cut wrong? Maybe. Is the bell off kilter? Maybe. But either way, it all needs to fit. So it doesn't really matter. We're just gonna start fitting this. So how do you even begin to fit? Well, you need to lock down the major stuff. Is this square? Is it? Yes, it's 90. Is this 90 degrees with the sides? Yes. Does it line up? Yes. When everything's lined up where you want it to be, but it just doesn't fit, then we're gonna start chasing all of these gaps to make them even. So the first thing you do is, is start with whatever's touching first. As you can see, there's a gap on this, a big gap. But as we move to the outside, that gap closes. And now there's no more gap. Now it's where we want it to be. So how do we adjust all this to make it the same? Well, we're basically going to get rid of this space and touch whatever's, or get rid of whatever's touching first. So this is just sticking out like a sore thumb. So we're going to immediately trim this corner back to the point where the gap looks pretty even with the rest of it. Now what's a little tricky on this is we're on a curve and there's fast curves and there's slow curves. Slow curve is gonna be a nice arch. A fast curve is gonna be like a return. So this has a little of both worlds. You have a very quick curve on the edges and then it kind of flattens out to make its way over the, the front of the belt. And of course it picks up again on the turn. So what does that mean to us right now? Well, if you take a little, it's gonna go pretty far and it's gonna affect the gap. So slowly increment, we're gonna take away material to itch this thing forward just a little bit to close all these gaps. Once we take care of this touching one and it's gonna open that up for a nice even gap, we're gonna see how that fits, but chances are we're gonna to have to look at the bottom side and adjust that too. Hey guys, I just wanna include a couple pointers here. Um, you know, we're gonna be moving this thing off and fitting it back on and moving it back off and fitting it back on. So it's imperative that this doesn't move. You need to make sure that this remains square and plumb all the time and your jack stands are the same way you don't want to start pulling them out and putting them back just keep things at bay keep things as they are and when you start trimming pieces commit we're commit to this fit right now and now we're just kind of refining it to close all of our gaps if you're kind of willy-nilly or you do a little bit of this and then you come back in two days it's, it's not wise all the time you want to just stay on task and make sure that everything is consistent until the point where this is tacked in place and you don't have to worry about it so don't freak out if it's not perfect just take little increments at a time work in one sections fit fit and keep fitting and soon enough you'll you'll get it all addressed and it'll fit very nice all right well initially this is touching and, and this gap needs to open up so i'm getting a marker and i'm putting it on here and it's important that you just hold it in one position and keep it the same so it's consistent so if i hold it right here i'm at the cusp of that line and i'm not going to move and i'm just going to make my way around so i just did this and i got a mark down but it's hard to see especially when you got glasses on and flat grinders flying so I got my black mark down with a marker and now I'll come back in with my soapstone. I got a nice sharp edge on there so it's not too dull. And I'm just gonna copy that line just so I can see it better when I'm under glass and the grinder's rolling along. Bam. There's my line right there. Let's get it trimmed. All right, 
we're at the crossroads again. Fabrication is all about just making decisions on what to deal with, with what's on hand. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of material on this. We can constantly make all these little changes and take a material away till all this gap is perfect. So one of the things we're, we're uh, weighing out is the plane of this, you know. Our gap is to the point now where maybe if we just raise this up a quarter inch up or quarter inch down, it would take care of a lot of our cope and it would line things up much nicer and clean. So we just discussed that and what we did is we found center of this and then we pulled the measurement from the ground and ultimately you want this to be right in the center of your cooking grate. So the theory is that it draws evenly over the course of this manifold and collects right at the grill grate. So if we're a quarter inch up or down from that, no, it, it doesn't matter. At it's all. not going to matter. Does that save us an hour of coping? Yeah. Then let's do it. <laughs> then we'll, make, we'll move it. Yeah, right now where this, where this gap sits right now, it's reasonably close. But there is a, a slightly larger gap at the top than there is at the bottom fit up. And so by we've got all these radiuses working with us here. So we could literally just drop this down just a tiny bit. And that may fix all of what, like Aaron was just saying, just dropping the whole... This is all level. It's every everything's right on that within half a degree. Yeah. And uh, so we could literally just drop it down a little bit. And so we're going to do that with our jack stands. Yep. We're going to slowly bring this down, and hopefully it'll open up the gap in the bottom and close the gap at the top. We're trying to just move on the curve of the bell. Is all we're doing. It's going to move down. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Except what you got to do is make sure you got room for your jack stand to thread. Which I don't. don't. <laughs> you don't either. <laughs> um, so <laughs> what a dumb idea. <laughs> <laughs> Can't complain about that. Nope. Okay. What do you think? You like it? I don't love it, but I'm close. Okay. So what now, we gotta do? now I want to just work my way around this whole seam and whatever's touching, we're going to make a note in chalk and we're going to remove some material. Again, we're just trying to get everything as tight as possible. So we're going to do one more round of cleanup and fit and see how she does after that. Cool. Right on, man. Would you have weld this thing by now? <laughs> you know, I mean, that's something to talk about is, uh, you know, when you're doing a fit up like this, like we said earlier, a gap is a good thing in some scenarios, yeah. you know, so if you, if you really get obsessed about closing a gap up, but you can fit like maybe a piece of 10 gauge or something in between that gap, is it really a problem? And I honestly do not think it is. Your, your weld puddle should only be about three eighths of an inch wide in this situation like this. And just one good pass would cover that. As long as you get penetration down inside that joint and you're running your welder hot enough, well, there's a whole nother thing. Who cares about stacking dimes? Did, it, did the weld penetrate? That's really what the real cause, or what the real matter of the conversation is. Sure. And if you're getting, if you have a gap there, you're pretty much guaranteed you're gonna get good penetration and you're not gonna have a gap or, or a, a cracked weld or a leak, anything like that. Within yeah. reason, yeah. Within reason, yeah. <laughs> so I've, I've seen some guys though, on a thing like this, if they've got a wider gap, they'll actually put round bar in there and fill it in. Um, run two passes side by side that lap like a root and then two passes. Sure. I, I don't think I would do that, but uh, you know, if there's nothing wrong if you have that situation and you need to. Yep. And uh, you know, is it weldable? Sure. Absolutely. But you're going to have, you know, two different things, scenarios going on under your weld. So, you know, in this shop, we'd like to keep things clean and consistent and mm -hmm. uh, equal. So, we want to, you know, if it takes us maybe another half an hour, 45 minutes to get that fit down, when we get done, that weld has no excuse. It's yeah. an even gap. It's the best scenario for the welder to lay down that bead. Yeah. Yep. Totally agree. So now you're just going to repeat what you did a minute ago and, yep. and walk gonna, out the trace. And I'm going to walk around and see what's touching and what's stopping it from nesting. And I'm going to take it off a little bit, just cut a little bit off. And I'm going to drink a beer and watch him do that. Another until beer. He asks me for to help him move this thing. <laughs> How's your bottom looking? Perfect. You have a perfect bottom? You have a perfect bottom. <laughs> that looks good. Yeah, it does look good. 
pretty bad. It looks good, man. Okay, so what are we doing now? We got a really right. good fit, top and bottom. Yeah, the top and bottom look ideal for a nice, well beat in there. There's a little bit of a gap. Some spots it's eighth inch. I think the maximum is maybe three sixteenths, and others are, are almost touching. Yeah. So overall, that's great. We can fill that in, it'll look consistent, and your bead will be the same throughout the whole thing. 0 0.07. Yeah, so we're still dead on. Our stands haven't moved at all. Um, we did drop this down, so now this mark that I made earlier is not right. So what we're gonna do is mark it a different way so we don't get confused. Yeah, and we're gonna use a scribe, and that'll just put a little bit of a groove in this metal. So even after we pull this off and you grind over it, hopefully it'll still be there. You can kind of see where it should be. Yeah. So uh, the next step is right now, we're gonna have to get all this paint off of here and, and uh, clean this up to where we can weld on it. And then we're also gonna go ahead and cut out the hole, right? That's it. Yeah, so we'll set this out of the way. Okay. I did, actually, I did. it freaking moved like crazy. All right, guys, so uh, Aaron's gonna take a break. He just got that all cut out, and uh, he cut on the inside of the line there so that whenever he gets a good fit up here, he'll have a perfect place to weld and, and get all that going. So I scribed that, he scribed that line where we want our final fit up to be, and there's a little bit of a groove that I cut in there with that Metabo, with that slicer disc. So now I'm going to take this grinder, I'm going to run all the way around this, give myself a good inch, inch and a half all the way around, try to make it look nice and even. This Harbor Freight surface conditioner is a great tool for doing that. Um, alternatively, you can use a, uh, looks like an angle grinder or something with a paint remover disc, works good. Um, you can use a flap disc or a hard disc, but it's going to remove some material. Um, it's also going to get clogged up with this paint, this paint's some pretty intense stuff. Um, something to keep in mind, you know, you really should wear dust masks, stuff like that. Keep a good breeze. We just opened up the other door and the breeze is blowing that way away from me. So, um, but you really should reserve some safety precautions when you're doing paint like this and stuff. So what we've been doing is uh, we had two different shots here where we fit it back on hit it with the, we made a few more marks just to kind of tweak things in a little bit. This is our last fit here. I'm pretty happy so far, I think we're there. Yep, that feels good. Well, that really tightened up, didn't it? Yeah, my goodness, look at that. So part of this fitting is uh, once we cut the hole in the end of the belt, it actually relaxed and sunk in. And as soon as it did that, it changed all of our lines. So if this is the part where you just keep kind of chipping away and slowly fitting it in there, um, there's gonna be a lot of factors. This is gonna be out around, and then it's gonna be out around again once you cut it open. So just anticipate, it's, you're gonna be fitting all the way up until the very last minute, and then it, then it should be right there on the money. And that's where we're at right now. So anyway, I think we're like there, man. You want to get set up to tack this thing in place? Yeah. Uh, let's do maybe it. check square one more time. All right. I, I'm with you. Okay. All right. So it's time to weld, and um, there's a lot of factors going on here. So we're going to just go over a couple things that I always do uh, before I get down. One of them is clean your surfaces. Make sure all the gunk's off there. There's going to be no grease or grime or nothing. It's just clean, smooth, uh, freshly worked edges. And uh, you know we really want to keep a puddle uh, low and flat like anything else here. 
So a lot of, we have a gap on some of this. So what I'll do is I'll come in here and I'll start a small puddle like this. And then I'm gonna go back and preheat. And I'm gonna come back up and bring my puddle down again. Come back, preheat, tie in my puddle. And this is gonna be my pattern along the whole way. Pretty fancy there, dude. Well, consistency is key. Practice, patience, just do a little bit of a time. Don't weld beyond the parameters of your welder. If you get like six inches of weld down and your welder is getting really hot and it starts not performing at its best, stop. Let that thing cool off and come back and get to your bead. You're gonna have a nicer bead, uh, a real performance. Uh, <laughs> you're gonna have a nicer bead and it'll just be uh, nice and flat if your welder is not trying to cool itself off. And important, most importantly, you'll have dimes that you welded in there that uh, are actually a good weld. Or the, yeah, that are worthy. It'll, it'll reduce all the splatter and all the craziness that happens when these welders get too hot. What settings are you running? Uh, we're at 19.5 uh, volts and then uh, travel speed at 240 on this particular welder. That's for our wire coming out. Is it a champ or a chump? It depends. <laughs> Depends on what? <laughs> Depends on how long you're welding with it. <laughs> yeah. I like this welder. It does get a little warm. It takes a little break, but um, it's kind of humid where we're at, so I often have to stop and get my lens kind of cleared out from the humidity, and I just let my welder cool off at that point. Um, I'll clean the weld in between and then get right back to it. That's the ESAB 115 or uh, 215 IC. EM IC, yeah. It's just a big old one. It's not available anymore. It's a good machine. We're using a Profax gun that was made for it. But what we do have to change right now is it's windy in here. So we, we got to get rid of this door. wind. Which door are you going for? We're going to shut this big one here. Yeah. Dixie. There's our cherry wood. Check I got to shut out. your door. All right, let's we'll start off in the center. Do a little half inch weld. I'm going to tack my corners. That's that good paint stuff. We got some paint we got to clean off. You can hear it. All right, then I'm going to just split what I just did. So these tacks are small enough, when I come back and put in my main pass, they'll just be consumed within that pass and you won't see them. Okay, so basically now we've got this collector box fit up. We're confident, it, this is all tacked. We're confident this head ain't gonna move anymore. Um, the next logical step, I think, would be to go ahead and weld out part of this thing. Yeah. And then we can move on to the doors, I think. That's right, yeah, that'll um, be next. Or actually probably the sled you know, get this thing on its own two legs. That sure. way, once the sled is attached, you know, we're gonna work on doors, they're gonna be final at that point. We're not gonna have a lot of anything moving around at that point. That's right. Um, how much you wanna bet on camera here that when we cut doors, they're gonna spring? Do you think they'll spring or do you think they're, are you team doors are gonna spring or team doors and doors aren't gonna spring? Man, I don't, it's a crapshoot, I don't know. I would say they would not spring, because this thing looks like it's untouched. It just looks yeah. like it's factory, but old, you know? Like there's no dents in it, there's no weird seams or repairs or anything. So if we cut them right and we leave the corners and then we cut back and take care of those at the end, I think it has a pretty good chance of not springing too much, but yeah. you never know. Well, so far on uh, propane tank cookers, I'm like five for five that have not sprung. Oh, that's so pretty far. good. Uh, you know, the one that I was on purpose trying to spring the doors was bingo, and those doors did not spring. <laughs> that was the whole point. Yeah. So vote down in the comments. Let me know if you think these doors are going to spring when we cut them in the next video, and uh, we'll see what happens. But uh, anyway, Aaron's going to weld this thing out, and uh, we'll see how it goes. All right. Yeah. Um, by the way, we have, an online, we have an online community called SmokerBuilderU.com. Now you can go over there and join for free. There's no strings attached. However, if while you're in there, you decide that you want to take advantage of any of our online courses and stuff about building smokers, they're there. You can take advantage of that. And uh, we add to that regularly. As a matter of fact, every week I do a free live Zoom call where I actually am doing the course live. 
and you can join me on that Zoom call every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock Central Time USA. And uh, the first half of that is actually me instructing about something about bu building pits or design or something like that. The last half of that is a Q&A session that sometimes can go pretty long. Um, we do other stuff like that too, but all of those are put in that online course area for replay. So tons and tons and tons of great content like what we're talking about here. A lot of whiteboard drawings with me scratching stuff and diagnosing people's pits and things like that. So be sure to join us over on Smoker Builder U. And don't forget, we're making a set of plans for this build. Um, you can find that over at smokerplans.net. Um, but in the meantime, we've got over 240 sets of plans and designs over there that you can choose from that uh, cover everything from 1,000 gallon pits all the way down to pipe style pits. Gravity feeds, doesn't matter. You dream it, we got a set of plans for it. So um, anyway, until next time, keep your smoke thin and blue. And I think Aaron's ready to weld this thing out. Huh? I'm ready. Yeah, good job, man. All right, good job. Here we go.